thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, Olivia, do you want to keep an eye on the folks coming in yep. the room? Okay, sweet. And we'll kind of just let people trickle in here. But I'm going to start our presentation today with just a little intro. Um, just like I said, thank you so much for making the time. We're super excited for this webinar. I've been looking forward to this for quite a while. Uh, this is Processing Primer for the producer. My name is Taylor Molia. I work for the Kibera Coalition, and we are doing this webinar series called Meet Business Fundamentals uh, in partnership with Olivia Tinkani, who I've really enjoyed working with. So thanks for joining us. Okay, so, um, so if you haven't heard of the Kibera Coalition, let's give you a quick rundown. This is a nonprofit based in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, I'm in Lyons, Colorado, working remotely. But the Kibera Coalition, um, through education, innovation, and collaboration, we work in coalition with ranchers, farmers, government agencies, and land stewards to foster resilience on working lands. And my job within the nonprofit is uh, at the New Agrarian Program, which is an eight-month apprenticeship for uh, beginning farmers and ranchers to get some experience on a working operation uh, somewhere in the West. So I help find and support the sites here in Colorado. So if you'd like more information about the program and what we do, you can go to kiveracoalition.org. And don't forget, this is uh, the second in our three-part series. So our next webinar will be Strategies for Starting a Meat Business, What to Think About from the Beginning. It'll be on May 9th from 9.30 to 11.30 a.m. And we're very excited about that. We have such a killer lineup of producers that are going to be very vulnerable, going to share their stories about um, their businesses. And I'm just, I, you just don't find conversations like that very often. So I'm very excited. And also, we would just love your feedback during the presentation during this series. So I'm going to share the form in the chat at the beginning. I'm going to share it at the end. I'm going to share it in the email. Just lots of opportunities. If you have any feedback, good or bad, we'd love to hear it. We always are looking for ways to make this, um, this kind of programming fit what you're looking for. And okay, just a couple Zoom basics. I think we're all pretty versed on this by now. Um, if you're on the phone, it's star six to mute and unmute. Uh, we do love to have folks keep their cameras on if possible during this, because it's really nice for the presenters to see actual faces. But we understand if you need to jump off for a little bit. Um, you can practice using the chat right now. If you want to jump on there, say your name, um, maybe where you live and what's your operation. And then if you haven't already, there sometimes Zoom puts a funky name um, by default, but we like to see people's real names. So if you find your little square with your video, you'll find three dots, click that, you'll, hit, you'll see rename, and then you can put your real name and maybe even your pronouns too. That helps us identify you. Okay, yep, and just some other simple stuff, keep yourself on mute for large group presentations. Um, be aware that everyone can see your comments. So if, if you wouldn't say it in person, don't say it in the comments. But if you need anything, I'm here. You can message me directly. And then please take care of yourself. We'll have a break uh, during this session, but it is two hours. So if you need to get up and use the bathroom or get some water, um, go for it. We're just happy you're here. And at Kibera, we like to kick things off uh, with a land acknowledgement. So the land where I live, uh, present day Lyons, Colorado, is the ancestral homeland of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, Ute, and Sioux, or Ocheti Sakawin peoples. We recognize the indigenous, indigenous peoples as the original and long-standing stewards of this land. Their extensive knowledge and practice of agriculture and land management established the foundation of land stewardship here. We recognize that this land and this knowledge was forcibly taken and appropriated from indigenous peoples. As fellow stewards, we honor and respect the land and peoples who have cared for it since time immemorial and we commit to continue building partnerships with Indigenous people. And with that, I will pass it off to Olivia and she'll get us started today. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Taylor. <clears throat> it's great to be here, everybody. So my name is Olivia. I hail originally from California. I live most of the time overseas and I am an independent farm business educator, farm and ranch business educator. Um, and I'm so the co-creator of this series for Kavira, it's been wonderful and sort of a couple years in the making, um, co-conspiring with Taylor and trying to figure out how to bring deeper programming to this community here. 
Um, my background is in farming and food service operations as well. And then I accidentally slowly drifted into consulting and curriculum design and development and making farmer training programs, just like this one. So my passion is really for teaching the back end of business to farmers. So I'm thrilled to be able to do that in partnership with Kavira and today in partnership with David Zarlane, who is going to introduce himself in just a minute. Um, so Taylor already did all of the details about that. This is the first uh, three series of the series we're presenting in the spring, and then we're going to do some stuff in the fall, and then we're going to do some stuff in future years. So just stay abreast via via the Kavira newsletter. Um, and I think she covered all of the other housekeeping items, but just keep keep your comments free flowing in the chat and I'll try and get to them unless it's not my purview of expertise, in which case we'll wait for David to give us a break and then we'll ask him those, um, those pressing questions. And, and if you have technical issues, you can sort of touch base with either Taylor and I will be here the whole time. So with that, I'm gonna drop uh, David and I's contact information in the chat so you have it to begin with. I'll do it again later also. Please feel free to reach out to us uh, in in sort of the aftermath of this webinar. We really like engaging with people afterwards, <clears throat> not just hearing your feedback, but also hearing your additional questions. So don't be shy about that. And then um, I'm gonna pass it off to David. Tell us who you are, David, and get us rolling. Good morning, everyone, uh, or good afternoon or evening. I saw someone calling in from Africa, so I, I think you're probably pretty late over there. Um, nice to see everyone's face this morning. I'm David Zarling. I am a uh, founder of Northwoods Group Consulting and a program manager for NPAN, the Niche Meat Processor Assistance Network at Oregon State University. My background is in, I'm a butcher, first and foremost. That's where I started. Um, I actually started as a dishwasher because I knew I wanted to become a butcher, but couldn't afford culinary school. Didn't know how else to get in there. So, so that's how I started many, many moons ago. And um you know, regional food security and uh, building the middle of the meat supply chain is deeply important to me. And I think it is deeply important to everyone, especially after what happened a few years ago, we saw the vulnerabilities in our nation's meat supply. So um, yes, yeah, butchery is my passion. Um, but what gets me going now is plant management. So I've, I've been a plant manager for several small and mid-sized meat processing facilities around the country over the years. And um, the things that excite me most about that are building relationships, win-win relationships with uh, small producers, team development within the meat processing space. You know, we don't have uh, a lot of workforce that's entering into the space. And so kind of developing uh, that, that next generation of great meat processors is really exciting to me and providing technical assistance to both producers and processors as we go. So that's, that's really what I do at NPAN at OSU. Uh, we have some, some pretty exciting technical assistance options for producers and processors. And, and we have a lot of people, a deep bench of uh, technical assistance providers to help you out. So uh, I'll be sharing some resources, you know, probably via Olivia for how to get a hold of me afterwards if you'd like to talk more. Um, and if I'm not the person for you with the answer, uh, I undoubtedly, I uh, or Taylor or Olivia know that person. So i um, really excited to have you here today. A couple of things about how I present. I really love a discussion. Um, I think that, you know, after the, after the pandemic, especially we're all like somewhat burned out on sitting through two hour didactic webinars, you know, and lectures. So if anything comes alive for you as we're talking, if you have any questions or um, or thoughts or experiences or or want to add anything, I would love to share the microphone or or hear from you. So please feel free, although I will be stopping um, throughout for questions. So with that, I will share my screen. Let's see here. Okay. So today, uh, this is a processing primer for the producers. So essentially what we're gonna be going over are four main areas that I think are kind of the, the, the toolkit of essentials that you need going into 
the meat business. You know, if you're going to be working with a new processor, or perhaps you've got a processor you've been working with for years, and you'd like to uh, reestablish your relationship or deepen that relationship or figure out how you can squeeze more juice out of that relationship. These are some of the things that that I think that um, if I could go back and teach my younger self when I was a producer some things. These are the these are the items that I wish that I knew. And if you've been in the business for a long time, there'll be some things in here that you might find interesting. I don't think that this is only for the brand new producer. I think that there's some nuggets in here for everybody. Um, and uh, yeah, this is kind of our toolkit. So we're going to go through four main sections and we'll stop for questions after each one. First one is inspection types 101. We're going to talk about personal and custom exemptions. We're going to talk about federal and state inspection, those being very similar. And then we're going to talk about retail exemption and all of the exciting things that fall under that umbrella. And we're going to move to meet your processor. And this is a section that's devoted to, hey, we've got somebody new we're working with. Uh, these are the things that we should think about as we're going into that relationship. The processing space is really changing a lot right now because we have a lot of people who have gotten into meat processing out of necessity or entrepreneurship or what have you, um, who aren't from the space and are approaching meat processing in a different way than a lot of the old school places, which is really exciting because we have some fresh takes and some fresh attitudes and some new business acumen being brought to the space. And so I'd like to um, share some tips on how to start off on the right foot, building a win-win partnership. Our third section is going to be, so you've got a slaughter date. Now what? You know, that can be the hardest part because many of these places are booked out 12 to 18 months. But if you get on the schedule, what do we need to do next? And then we'll talk about post-harvest and what happens, you know, when your animal's on the cutting block, what are the things that we need to be thinking about during and after pickup? So let's dive in. <clears throat> uh, let's discuss the three inspection statuses. And actually, before I jump in, um, I will not have a chance to look at the chat box. So Olivia, if anything pops up, please do feel free to interrupt me at any point. So I, I kind of look at inspection in three buckets, federal and state, because they are very similar. And we'll talk about those similarities, personal and custom exemptions. Those are also very similar and then retail exemption. And uh, the people that might find this useful, you may be wondering where you fit into this. This is not just for uh, just, you know, direct to consumer producers. These are also for, if you have a small butcher shop, you might have a, a restaurant in addition to your livestock operation. Uh, you may be thinking about online selling or aggregation. These are all things that can apply to you if you are any of these categories. So let's start out with uh, our key takeaways from this section. So I would love if you were able to walk away with an understanding of the intention behind custom exemption and how some people are maximizing the benefits of that status. A lot of people think it's an old, outdated model. Uh, I personally feel like it's underutilized and we've actually got more juice to squeeze there. I'd also love it if we could become familiar with the basic requirements of retail exemption. And we're going to explore some innovative approaches to taking full advantage of the retail exemption. So let's start with federal and state. <clears throat> Not every state has a state inspection program, but more and more are forming cooperative agreements with FSIS, uh, AKA the USDA. And basically when it comes to state inspection, what you, what you need to know is that the requirements for state inspection must be at least equal to federal inspection compliance. So some folks think that, um, you know, th th there's, there's a discussion going around about state inspection being a lower barrier to entry. From a regulatory standpoint, if you want to go under state inspection, it, sh it will be the exact same program as going under federal inspection. So some people say to me, David, why would I want to go under state inspection if it's exactly the same as federal, but I can only sell it within my state? Why would I not just go fully federal? Well, 
The reason for that is because in most states, state inspection uh, programs tend to be more community focused. They tend to take more of a teaching and assistance approach. Uh, there's a more personal touch. You can get more site visits. It tends to be much more personable. And uh, any of our, our folks from Montana or Oregon uh, who are under under these um, programs, you know, I've heard a lot of really good things about them. So that's that's a main motivator. So it is a bit of a lower lower barrier to entry because you get more assistance. Now, what do these two things have in common? Um, the basic basic requirements for federal inspection is that everything must comply with the Food Safety Modernization Act and the 1996 pathogen reduction rule. Now, what's this mean for us as producers? Uh, does anybody know what happened in the early 90s that forced this major overhaul of um, food safety and HACCP? Feel free to pop that in the chat if you know what happened, if you were been around long enough to remember. For those of you that weren't, uh, mad cow was definitely something that was of, of huge concern then. That's a really good one, right? That was a that's there are major provisions in those rules that have to do with mad cow. Excellent. Another one uh, was Jack in the Box, 1993. 400 illnesses and a handful of deaths from E. coli because you could order a burger to order at a fast food restaurant back then. And HACCP was not required, and there were certain food safety regulations that were not enacted. And the American public said, look, we want to be able to go into a fast food restaurant and trust that, that we're not going to get sick. And so uh, Food Safety Inspection Service, FSIS, adopted some rules that did make it a little bit more expensive and costly for processors. Uh, all animals under federal inspection must be slaughtered in compliance with the Humane Slaughter Act. And that's something that, that we can share some resources about. But I can assure you there are lots of horror stories about slaughterhouses and animal welfare. But as much as that may make it to the media, I, I can assure you that 99% of slaughter in the U.S. is an absolutely zero tol tolerance policy for anything other than swift and painless kill. Uh, and so that's a great benefit of federal inspection. And FSIS takes it so seriously that while Temple Grandin does believe in human error and that there should be some leeway for accidents, uh, FSIS disagrees with her and believes that it is absolutely zero tolerance. So that's something that you can you can take to the bank when it comes to FSIS. Uh, federal inspected Federally inspected products may be sold nationally or internationally. So they can go across state lines, they can go across uh, international lines. Um, and we're able to do that because everything produced under federal inspection must meet FSIS labeling standards. So those labeling standards basically in a nutshell say, if it's on a label, it must not be misleading to the customer. Now, we can probably have an entire two-hour webinar just on greenwashing and various things that happen in the labeling space, but but we'll save that for another time. So, um, yeah, that's federal and state inspection in a nutshell. Basically, it's it's open open border for where you can sell federally inspected meat, as we know. Now, the other end of the spectrum is custom and personal exemption. So... The idea here is uh, the product that is slaughtered under custom exemption should go through a basic format like this. I have an animal. You would like to purchase some beef from me. You are going to be the end user, you, your family, and your guests at your home. The way that this is intended is that you come to me, you purchase the animal while it's alive, I finish the animal. I or you then schedule your processing with a processor. You pay me for the animal. I keep the record of the sale. I give you a copy. I give the processor a copy. The processor does whatever you like. They coordinate with you for how you like it cut it up. And uh, then you pick it up directly from them and you pay the processor. So essentially, the producer, as you know, I'm sure lots of people here do this, sell the animal live. 
the end user owns it. The processor simply sells a service. Uh, so this product is meant to be used exclusively by the owner of the livestock, members of the owner's household, non-paying guests, and household farm employees. Um, there are lots of people around the country that 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 flex these rules, and they may have someone pay for a ticket to an event and meet as part of it. Um, you'll see cooperative agreements in different states where some custom exempt meat can be donated to food banks, although generally speaking under federal regulations that is not uh that's not permitted so that is something that that can be handled state to state but generally those are the big rules so the intention is to preserve farmer to customer direct relationships buy a meat from your neighbor feeding your family no resale no margins right so uh, it's a, it's an old school way of doing things, and personal exemption is very similar, except for there's no transaction. You kill your old, your own animal, you send it to the custom exempt processor, they send it back to you. You and your family and your non paying guests get to have as much of that as you like. Okay, so animals slaughtered and processed under custom exemption must be in such a way that it complies with the Humane Slaughter Act and federal re regulations regarding sanitation, label accuracy, and record keeping are actually in there. So. Uh, it's not regularly enforced. However, custom exemption is not the Wild West that it often appears to be. It should still comply with federal regulations for sanitation, labeling, and humane slaughter. What do you need to keep for custom exemption? You need to keep a chain of custody records and an affidavit of animal age. Animal age is very important because of uh, mad cow prevention, right? We want to keep those materials out of the food chain. Then we've got uh, some additional opportunities under custom exemption. So people think it's really limiting, right? Like we, 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 we may not want to go custom because it's so old school. People don't have giant chest freezers so in, and are buying whole and half beefs anymore. Like this is kind of an outdated method. We hear this all the time. However, some points of interest. USDA does not have a specific rule about how many shares uh, you may sell in any one animal. Some states restrict to four or eight per animal, okay? But some states like Oregon do not have such a restriction. So I, in the past, have raised beef and sold it, and I sold sixteenths of an animal, which is a, a really manageable amount of meat. It ends up being between 35 and 50 pounds of meat. Um, but how, how does that happen, right? If, if someone came to me as a plant manager and said, hey, I've got 16 cut sheets for this animal, I'd tell them to, to take a hike, right? Get back in your car and, and go home. And the way that this happens, here's, here's a quick example of how that can actually happen, okay? There's a producer here in Washington that holds an open house twice a year where customers sign up. And this, this producer says, look, I've got those beeves over there that are going to be halves. These are going to be quarters. These are going to be eighths. These are going to be sixteenths. And the way that they do it is that the, the uh, farmer manages the bundles. So they have one animal cut the same way, and then they assemble boxes that have a predetermined amount of grind roasts and steaks. So you may not know exactly how many ribeyes or flat irons or top sirloins or chuck roasts you're going to get, but you know you're going to get X amount of steaks, X amount of roasts, and X amount of grind, and that's your bundle. Now you were a part owner of that beef, but you were know you were going to get X amount of meat. So it's a nice way to simulate the beef bundle or beef share model under custom exemption without having to go through uh, federal inspection. If you have more questions on that, I can elaborate more deeply, please, at the end of this section, feel free to, to ask. Uh, now we're gonna get into retail exemption and I just wanna tell a story before we get into it because uh, there, there's some cool parts here. So there's, there's a place down in Utah near Salt Lake City uh, that's run by a fellow named Nathan. And Nathan, uh, during the pandemic, his, his butcher shop wasn't doing so well. Um, a lot of butcher shops were doing well, but people weren't able to come into the shop and he was having a hard time figuring out how to make that work. So he learned about retail exemption and what he started to do was take advantage of all of the provisions there. 
some interesting things that Nathan's did to innovate his business and grow it during a challenging time was uh, he put up refrigerated meat vending machines all over town. And we'll talk more about that. He was able to have an e-commerce business where he sold online and shipped all around the country. He had a farmer's market stand. Uh, he was participating in a food hub situation, which I'll explain more soon. I got a call from someone that said, hey, this guy's, do this guy's got vending machines. This guy's got stand-up freezers and grocery stores. He's not processing under inspection. You ought to know about it. I want you to audit this and find out where he's breaking the law and let us know. Interestingly, none of those were breaking the law, and we'll talk more about that now. So retail exemption. <clears throat> retail exemption started in the 1970s. Uh, basically, it's the equivalent of, of a grocery store or meat department. That's how it started, right? You've got this meat department that brings in carcasses or box meats that are federally inspected. They're not inspected except for by the county. They are able to break down those cuts and sell them directly to the end user, right? That's the classic example of a retail exemption. Operations... Uh, of this type are are basically doing standard retail store oper you know activities cutting up slicing trimming carcasses uh, grinding and freezing curing cooking smoking rendering refining of livestock fat all of those things can happen in a retail exempt operation as long as you are selling directly to the end user now there are two types of customers for retail exempt operations you can sell to household users or the end user or what the government defines as other than household use, uh, consumers, which are hotels, restaurants, and similar institutions. Now, there are some limits on those things, okay? You cannot cure, cook, smoke, or render and sell wholesale or to those other than household consumers. You can't do that. Um, However, you can sell raw products, whether that's cuts, grind, sausage, what patties, what have you, to those wholesale institutions under retail exemption. If you happen to be a producer who wants to process some of your own meat in a, say, a commissary kitchen or a state, uh, a county or city inspected kitchen, you could be grinding your own beef and selling it wholesale to restaurants, hotels, and institutions up to a certain amount. So we have something called the 75-25 rule. Uh, you can sell up to 25% of your overall revenue as uh, other than household consumers, so wholesale, up until a certain dollar limit that's set by the federal government every year. In 2024, that's right about $100,000. It's just under, it's like 99 and some change. So if you've got a business where you are a livestock producer and you can get your animals killed, but you can't find processing and you're able to find, you're able to uh, process your own in a commissary kitchen or a county inspected kitchen, you can sell wholesale. Not only that, but there are some other interesting avenues. Uh, so this is just kind of a recap of what you can do when it comes to the what we call HRI, hotels, restaurants, and institutions. And um, this is this explains the 7525 rule. Um, and and also it's how many, how many um you can't sell more than one half of a carcass worth of meat in a transaction. And I, I see that my diagram got cut off there a little bit, but essentially it's it's about 300 pounds of beef. Um it's 27 pounds of lamb, and, and there's some other things there that that uh, when I send the resources out, I can I can kind of fix that. Some other interesting opportunities and and some little known ones uh, about retail exemption are what I'm most excited to share with you today. So, let's start with butcher shops, retail stores, and central kitchens. 
Okay. Butcher shops may sell bundles or subscriptions to meat CSAs as long as the source materials were slaughtered under USDA or state inspection. So if you're a producer and you can get your animals killed, but you can't get them processed, or you may already have another enterprise, say you've got a, a small commissary kitchen on your farm, or you've got a butcher shop, or you've got a restaurant, uh, you can sell bundles directly to the consumer. You do not have to have that federally inspected, those finished cuts, just the carcasses initially, okay? If the source materials were slaughtered under federal inspection, the products may also be sold across state lines via e-commerce, phone order, or in satellite stores across that state line. So you may be a producer that has a butcher shop. Like let's say you're here in Washington where I am, you're a producer in white salmon on the Washington side, and you've got a retail store in Hood River on the Oregon side of, of the Columbia. Your animals were slaughtered USDA. You've got a small cut shop on, on farm in Washington, and you've got a retail shop in Oregon. You can sell that meat in Oregon as long as you own the butcher shop. That's really surprising to a lot of people. Uh, butcher shops may produce their own value-added products, like I said, including cured, fermented, vacuum-packaged, uh, cooked, smoked, and more, as long as they comply with local regulations. Local regulations may require you to have a HACCP plan, but you as a producer can make these items. Food hubs. This is a really cool one uh, that's that's quite innovative and is, is really little known. So um, the federal government does not prohibit retail-exempt store operators from using third-party businesses, such as a food hub. OK, to advertise, market, store product in commerce uh, at an independent warehouse, deliver or collect the money on behalf of the producer. So here's how Nathan, the guy that I talked about in the beginning, here's how he did that. Nathan went to a local retail store and said, look, I can't put my meat in your case. I get my, my carcasses are slaughtered under USDA inspection. I process them at my butcher shop. I'd like to sell them in your butcher shop. However, I can't do that uh, because I don't own your butcher shop. However, what I can do is I can own this here stand-up freezer that I'd like to place in your butcher shop and rent floor space from you. And when people come and they purchase my meat, all you have to do is take the money on behalf of me Make sure you keep a record of what you sold, pass that money through, and I pay you rent to do that in your food hub. That's how that works. So it's a cooperative agreement uh, between two places. One may be an actual food hub, one which is kind of an aggregator of local products if you don't have them in your area, or it could just be a retail store that's willing to engage in a cooperative agreement like that. It's a very interesting way to take advantage, not in a bad way, but to, but to truly take advantage of this exciting program. That, that is there for us. And a lot of people are uh, unaware of this. I'm just gonna check the chat to see if there's any questions about that. Uh, the meats do need to be slaughtered under USDA to be sold at a food hub. Yes, that is true. That is true. A as is the case for all retail exempt items. Must be slaughtered under USDA, um, but does not need to be processed under USDA. Then we've got farmer's markets. Uh, contrary to popular belief, finished cuts do not need to be federally inspected to be sold at a farmer's market. As always, uh, the carcasses do need to be slaughtered under USDA inspection. However, um, as long as it was prepared in a retail store, butcher shop, or central kitchen, the booth acts as a satellite because you own the booth. The labeling must be accurate and contain the basic information like, you know, the product name and the weight and uh, and whatnot. And, and it has to be kept cool. You know, uh, you are subject to FSIS audit. I have, at my own farmer's market booth, had a field compliance officer from the USDA show up and, and check my temps, make sure my labels were correct. Um, but this is, this is a, a, a barrier to entry um, that's much lower than a lot of people think. And then we've got e-commerce, online marketplaces. So this is kind of an interesting one that, that is, again, somewhat little known. 
Retail exempt operations may sell their products via e-commerce. They may ship their products across state lines, provided that they are going to a household user. Now, you can't sell wholesale and ship it all over the country and, and pallets, right? We, we can't do that. Um, but uh, you can have an e-commerce website. Not only do you can you do it on your own website, but you can also utilize a third-party online marketplace, such as a barn to door, chop local. Uh, there's many others like that that you may be familiar with. And they can engage in, on your behalf, advertising, marketing, hosting the platform, distributing the product, and collecting money on your behalf, just like a food hub, except for it's all online. Uh, one great example of someone that does this is uh, Five Marys. Now they are now inspecting, they're, they're now producing under inspection at their own plant. However, there was a time when they were doing retail exempt processing and shipping and it was very successful for them. So that's, that's another little known opportunity under retail exemption. Again, the thing that all of these opportunities have in common is that you as a producer could take some of the processing into your own hands if you have the means, like a shop, restaurant, commissary kitchen. I have some processors here where I, uh, some producers where I live that take advantage of a community kitchen at a local community college. So they rent that kitchen, it's 15 bucks an hour. They go in there and they press sausage, they grind and they press sausage all day every day for their farmer's market booth and uh, online meat bundle business. And it's very successful, you know, and they're, they're able to um, produce as needed as opposed to having to rely on, on processing dates. So before we jump into section two, uh, I'd love to field some questions. If anybody has anything that they'd like to know more about or or uh, feel unsure about or think are kind of sticky with those regulations, now'd be a great time to chat about those. Does anybody have any, any questions or concerns or, hey, David, that is absolute horse hockey and is not true? Um, David, we have one in the chat that says, do e-commerce and online marketplace sales need to be FSIS? Only the carcass. So you just have to have that animal slaughtered under inspection. However, all of the finished cutting that you stock on your website can all be done under retail exemption, whether it's in a commissary kitchen, a community kitchen that's inspected by the county, um, you know, if you have a butcher shop, if you have a restaurant, all of those are on the table for processing under, uh, for your e-commerce program. Wow. That's very cool. It is. It's, it's, it's pretty surprising how yeah. lenient that, that regulatory framework is. It's, it's meant, it really is meant to support the small producer because the barrier to entry in FSIS processing, especially value added processing is so high. Uh, many, many very small producers, you know, they don't, they don't, they're not going to meet a minimum batch size of 400 pounds per smoke cart. They may just need to, you know, they may, they may just want to do 50 pounds per flavor or 25 pounds per flavor. And this is a really great way to be able to do that. Yeah, for sure. Um, we have another one that says, sorry if I missed this at the beginning, but there, are there any on-farm USDA slaughter? Oh, sorry. Uh, are there any on-farm USDA slaughter or is it all transport to a slaughter location? Excellent question. Uh, there, and I, <clears throat> I have a lot of experience in USDA inspected on-farm slaughter. That's how I got my start was on a mobile slaughter unit. That is absolutely available. Now, generally speaking, as long as you can have a, a mobile trailer or build a facility on your site that meets the federal regulations as far as sanitation, um, you know, animal handling, food safety and whatnot, you can have that right on farm. And if anyone's familiar with GAP certification, that's how you achieve that highest level of GAP certification is that your processing plant is on farm. And so that's totally on the table. Now there are challenges there, you know, when you're on a farm, obviously there are lots and lots of uh, microbiologics 
that are very healthy in a farm setting that are less desirable in a processing setting. So you have to think about those things, but it's totally on the table and the USDA can't say no when it comes to providing a, 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 an inspector. You know, contrary to, to uh, widespread belief, inspection is actually free. You only pay for inspection when it's overtime. You don't pay for an inspector to come. You know, you have to justify them coming. If you say, I only need one hour a week to twist sausage, like that's not necessarily, you know, they're going to ask you to do a little bit more. But I have several people that I work with who process one day a week on farm. That's it. And, and they have an inspector come out. So it's totally available to you. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah, this is so different than <laughs> everything I learned. Um, okay, uh, Carrie asked, um, it's my understanding that in Colorado, we can sell meat that is not USDA inspected. Um, is that correct or similar across the country? I, oh, I miswrote. Okay. I, we can sell non-USDA inspected meat to food pantries. Did I write that? I don't know. You didn't write that, but that's interesting. Meant to food pantries. Okay. Okay. That's great, Carrie. You know, I I'm a big supporter of cooperative agreements when it comes to pantries and and um you know uh, various uh, organizations like that. I, I think it's I, I think it's um yeah I'm highly supportive of it. I think it's great. I think you know there, there's another example of that is in New Jersey where they have I think it's Hunters for the Hungry where they have hunters go out and uh, kill, kill deer um, in large numbers and take those to custom exempt processors and they can donate all that meat to, you know, food, to you know, soup kitchens and food pantries. And, and uh, I think it's fantastic. So if your state has that, you know, um, I, I, I am in huge support of that. But that's not a national thing. It's, it's not, it's, it's pretty few and far between. Um, and, and I would like to see more of it. You know, uh, I think it's a great way to get wholesome animal protein uh, into into the hands of folks that really need it. Yeah. Yeah, that's very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Um, okay, maybe one more, David. Sure, please. Okay, cool. Uh, Alicia was asking, we want to start using our custom exempt chicken carcasses and USDA beef bones to make broth, but neither our WSDA or USDA inspectors know anything about the regulations. Do you have any info on those regulations? Would love to hear them. Let's see. Okay, so custom exempt chicken carcasses to make broth. That will be, if you want to do that, that will, um, if, whether you're processing it or, or someone else is processing it, that will be a relationship between you and the end user. So, you know, you won't be able to sell that broth uh, to anyone retail. But if, you know, uh, Leisha, are you a producer or a processor? Uh, we do both. <laughs> oh, right on. Okay, great. So if you're mm -hmm. the producer and you're the processor, you know, that obviously that's great under custom exemption and, and fits really well. You wouldn't be able to take the carcasses that were left over after you parted out the birds for your customers. You wouldn't be able to take those carcasses, make broth, and then sell them to the public. But you could offer that as a service to your customer and sell the service of the broth if that makes sense. So making broth is, is not, it's not a, it's a, it's not a, a super high margin item, right? Like there's, there's a significant amount of labor in that. And so you can include that in your, in your processing cost and, and uh, make sure that you don't just, you know, lose all that. Um, now, when it comes to making bro uh, broth out of your USDA beef bones, uh, you can make that broth as long as you're selling it to the end user under retail exemption. I know WSDA Bless their hearts. They 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 need some help with understanding those regulations. Uh, but and I also, if you're in Washington, I also know. Bless their hearts. The USDA needs some help with that too. Uh, I know I know that circuit quite well. But you are able to take those those bones that you get from your USDA processor, process those into broth as long as you're you know meeting basic food safety requirements on on heating time, meeting lethality and cooling time depending on how you're selling it, you know, um, if it's a ready, to, ready to drink item, you want it to meet lethality. If it's not, you know, you make it however you make it. Um, you just can't sell that wholesale. They don't permit rendering or cooking. Um, but it's, it's totally, totally fair game to sell it to your end users out of your farmer's market, uh, stand or, or, or your, your butcher shop or, or what have you online marketplace to an end user. 
Does that make sense? That was kind of word it, salad a little bit. It does, but um, I would, I, I do know somebody locally who has made chicken broth out of their custom exempt chickens and sells it in their, they actually have a, a, a shop, like a storefront. And they said that their, for their WSDA um, inspector said that was fine. So um, I don't know. I think it's just a weird gray area that nobody really wants to answer the questions that you have because it's not technically meat, but it's made from meat. Um, and it's, it's just a really strange, I had a conversation yesterday with our USD inspector for 20 minutes, just going over different, um, like temperatures, listeria tests, all these things that needed to take place. Um, but even he was like, I, but you know, and I'll, aside from like a general picture of food safety, he just they don't seem to want to talk about that very much. Yeah. Unfortunately, the training for state, county and city inspectors is not great. Um, and it's 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 even less great than the baseline training that USDA inspectors get. So I, I have a lot of compassion mm -hmm. for them because they they a lot of times are faced with questions that they don't know how to answer. Um, but I would say from a federally regulated standpoint, um, and now there are a lot of there are a lot of tiny poultry exemptions and interesting little things will fall under that from state to state. Generally speaking across the board, I would, I would get into a deeper question with my state inspectors and ask for the regulatory documentation just to, just as a CYA policy, because the federal regulations say that you cannot render uninspected bones and sell to the public because of the inherent pathogens in those. Let's say, for instance, I wanted to make bone broth and, you know, I, I, I didn't want to meet lethality with that broth or the temperature that I was choosing was not, uh, yeah, was not, was not high enough. Um, you would have some salmonella issues. So how about we, you know, I would love to talk with you more about this afterwards and okay. I'll make sure that my, my contact is in the in the uh, chat, but very, very good questions. Thanks. Okay, let's hop into section two. As we know, I, I can get a little wordy, so we're going to move right along here. Uh, this is all about meeting your processor. So what do we do? You know, we're, we've got someone that we're going to be uh, working with and we want to establish a relationship. So the key takeaways from this section, learn the ways that a small meat processor measures success to better understand why they do what they do. Explore some questions you can ask your processor when you begin working with them. And then uh, list some of your own values that you prioritize when looking for a meat processor. So uh, just, just pop into the chat really quickly, if you don't mind. What are some ways that you measure success for your business, whether you're a processor or a producer? What are some metrics you use? It might be how many head a year I sell or what my profit margin is or you know, what, whatever it is, if you're a processor, there's a thousand different things. What are some ways that you measure success in your business? Just as a thought exercise. There's a million ways, you know, um, yeah, people, the human capital that I generate, who is happy in my business, I love that. Consistency of product and meaningful sales, happy customers, all great feedback. I love that. Uh, similar to that, meat processors have metrics, right? We have ways that we that we uh, measure success. And these are some of the ways that I measure success in plants that I manage. Total pounds or head per day, pounds per labor hour, revenue dollars per labor hour, head per hour, overtime percentage, uh, fulfillment percentage, customer feedback, non-compliances, yield percentage. These are all the, the big formulas that go into determining why I run a plant the way that I do. But there's some things. Um, oh, Jen, I love those. Those are, those are really good, really good metrics. Um, understanding factors that affect a, pr a processor's success. This is kind of a way to understand why they do what they do, especially when it comes to policies, which can sometimes be somewhat stringent. 
Non-ambulatory injured or waspy animals can slow down that pounds per hour or head per hour metric. Improper producer documentation. Um, you know, sometimes if you sometimes if you if you get held up and you show up without what you need, that can slow down the line because they have to move things around on the schedule until you get that documentation. Uh, high levels of cut customization. You know, I once had someone that wanted to have three ounce portioned fillets individually packaged. That was very challenging for my cut team. Um, no shows and reschedules. That's a big one. Late or no show pickups. I've had meat in my freezer for nine months and you would think that people would want that, right? Um, that can really cause a bottleneck in your cold storage, uh, custom formulations, rising material costs. There's just so many things that can affect a processor's success and affect their behavior and their relationships. So how are some ways that a producer can collaborate or help? Um, and these are just some suggestions that the, the, the pressure isn't all on the producer to, to do all the compromising. It needs to be a win-win, but these are some things to think about. Um, you know, sorting your injured or waspy animals out uh, before you, you head over there, you know, um, having some transport records and cut sheets complete on or before the drop-off. Understanding hang time implications, which we will talk about, um, paying and picking up on time, uh, co-investing in, in future packaging equipment. You know, there's so many things you can do to prioritize your relationship and co-invest in that relationship with, the, with a, a processor. A word on hang times, and this is kind of a big one. So I, I, I like to bring this up because hang times are a huge point of contention um, between producers and processors. And, and I just want to share a, a few thoughts here. Um, most of the time, processors, don't take this personally, but most of the time processors do not have the means to properly dry age a carcass. And so when you get up in most small processors, when you get up past 14 days, you see prolific mold outgrowth. Okay. That mold does add a certain flavor to your beef that we've come to recognize as the dry age flavor, but it's really more flavor of blue cheese than it is, than it is meat. At 14 days, and there's lots of scientific documentation to uh, support this at the 14 day mark on a biological level there's nothing that happens to the, the protein itself from a qualitative perspective a taste and texture perspective 14 days is the maximum now you'll get additional moisture loss beyond that which someone could argue is concentrating flavor, but you also get major yield loss after that as well, okay? So that's something to really think about. Another thing to think about is the math of, of hang times, right? So if you ask for a 14-day hang, your processor's doing 10 beef a day, five days a week, two-week hang time, that's 100 carcasses in the cooler minimum. I know very few small processors that can handle 100 carcasses at a time. If you want 21 to 28, double that, right? Then we're getting into a larger plant space. So thinking about hang time and what you're asking for, uh, 14 days from a qualitative max is, is, is really uh, the max of, that I would ask for. Um, however, given blind taste tests in the past with other plants that I've worked with or worked for, we found that most chefs can't tell the difference between a seven day and a 14 day dry aged beef carcass if held under optimal conditions. Uh, we have also found um, at NPAN and through other organizations that burger is preferred by chefs in our limited blind taste tests at a five day hang time. So just things to think about. So really quickly, we'd love to do uh, just just a quick thought exercise um, when it comes to th that we can do um, in breakout rooms and partners. I would just love it if everybody would get together in pairs and name some values that are important to you in a processing partner and maybe also name your top one to two challenges. And, and uh, we can kind of fold that into some questions, our Q&A part of this section. You know, we can kind of address some of those challenges that you've had after we do those breakouts. So if you wouldn't mind, uh, Taylor's going to pair us up.
And, and uh, what we'd love to know are what are the most important values to you, say your top three when it comes to a processor for your pair, and what are your top couple of challenges that you've faced or are most worried about? And we'll just take a couple of minutes. It, it doesn't have to be more than, than uh, just a few. Yeah, we're going to take like two minutes each of, to introduce yourself to your partner, talk about the values that are important and your challenges. We'll prompt you guys to switch. And then, David, do you want to take a quick break after that? If anybody needs it. Maybe, yeah, we could we could take just a quick bio break, fill our coffees up, and then we'll come back. And that sounds great. Okay, sounds good. So I guess that would bring us back some somewhere around like uh, 32 after the hour-ish. 33 yeah. after the hour ish. Okay. Okay. Um, Olivia and David, do you guys want to be in groups too? I'll stay out. I'll okay. stay out. Okay. Oh gosh. All right. I'm gonna move you. But Sorry. you can just yeah, you're fine. I might need to just take one second. And All right, I think we're in good shape. Let's go for it. There we go. Oh, boy. So <clears throat> we all kind of have these issues and I had these exact same concerns when I was producer um, and, and had, you know, I was also managing my own plant at the time uh, or not my own plant, someone else's plant, but I was managing the plants where I was taking my own animals to, which I will definitely say uh, was challenging <laughs> because I was my own worst customer uh, it, on both sides of it. Right. And, and so um what I learned over the years is that uh, there are some some conversations that we can all have because in the end of the day, we we want a win-win partnership and we all know what it's like to have an adversarial relationship with their processor, right? What's the, what's the cliche processor? A grizzled old white guy who, you know, is argumentative and unrelenting, right? Doesn't field requests. And, and, and we know that, that, that trope. And I think that things are changing. You know, we're, we're seeing different people enter the space. Uh, some uh, exciting things that NPAN just put on a mastermind and 16 out of the 18 students were women processing business owners, right? We're seeing a change in the folks who are owning processing businesses, which is changing the dynamic and, um, some people are from different industries who have a different idea about what customer service is. So we have this huge opportunity to create win-win partnerships and it's well worth the investment. We can do this. We need each other. And I believe it's possible to have a harmonious, uh, our homo uh, a harmonious uh, environment. And so it's worth the investment because you can, to your points in the chat, schedule, uh, you can have scheduling priority when you have those win-win uh, partnerships. Um, we find that there's more willingness to reach compromises on specifications. Sometimes we see people invest in another success. When I was processing in Wenatchee, I had a value added plant. I had one producer who was so excited about us making them lamb landjager, ready to eat snacks that they, that was a total differentiator for them. They were willing to invest in a small component for our packaging machine that allowed them to have the exact product that they want. We paid for it. They spread it out over the cost of several thousand pounds of, of meat over the next two years. And we were able to co-invest in one, one another's future. Um, and, and to this day, that plant has a great partnership with that, that producer. Um, and at the end of the day, when we're getting what we need, uh, we have happier customers and, and customers' customers, right? And that's how I define success is the, the happiness or fulfillment of our customer's customer. Okay, so uh, sometimes your customer's customer is your per the person who purchases your meat's kids, you know. Um, and so 
how do we how do we forge these win-win partnerships? It's not always easy, right? It's not always easy with the processor, but there are questions that you can ask. And Olivia has helped me develop a list of questions that um, I think are are really approachable and easy to ask. And if you have someone who is resistant to these types of questions, you can kind of gauge what type of relationship you're going to have. So some of the some of the highlights here are: uh, what months do you need more volume? You know, are you completely dead in February and March? Is there a small adjustment that I can make to my feeding schedule, especially if I have hogs, uh, to get more volume during those months? I see that often uh, in certain parts of the country where people are are willing to do that because the processor may be willing to lower the price off season. You know, the cost of processing may have a discount, seasonal discount. Uh, what days of the week are best for my species? What time is an ideal drop-off? You know, is there a time where you're not busy that that uh, we can do this? What are your payment terms? Do you need it on pickup or do you have a net 14? Uh, can someone train me on your drop-off procedure? FSIS inspects the unloading process, and that's a huge component of a humane handling program that's vulnerable to non-compliances. Uh, so when I'm there dropping off my animals, can you train me? What's the best way for me to unload? Do you have a live scale? Do you track hot yields and cutting yields? Um, and, and how can I expect that? Is that going to come via email or, or with my paperwork? Um, would you mind walking me through your cut sheet and your feed schedule? Cut sheets can be uh, confusing. You know, Can you walk me through those? Let's talk about it. So there's all of these questions that you can ask a processor before you get started so that you're on the same page. And I, I do personally believe as a processor that you can uh, establish a really great relationship when you, when you uh, show this level of interest. You know, And again, if someone is unwilling to answer these questions, then, then that maybe tells you all that you need to know about how your relationship is going to start. And it may take a little bit longer uh, to develop that. So um, before we jump into section three, are there any questions in the chat? Yeah, we have one um, curious to know where in the U.S. people have access to mobile USDA slaughter. We don't have sure. access to that in Washington. So. Great question. Interestingly, Leisha, there are many mobile slaughter units in Washington uh, under USDA inspection. So we've got the Island Grown Food Cooperative in Skagit in Whatcom counties. Uh, they've got a truck that goes out and they also have a brick and mortar facility that just opened this week. You've got uh, the now defunct, they, they just went out of business, North Cascades Meat Producers Co-op, who sold their USDA inspected trailer to a fella down in uh, the Kalama area, and he's going to be coming up and running. You've got Puget Sound Processors. That's another one. Um, and they are all over the U.S. There's some in Texas, there's some in California, there's some in the East Coast, there's some in Colorado. Um, I'd love to share those resources with you afterwards in a follow-up, but there, there are there are several, um, but they they tend to hide under a rock, right? Because their schedules are really full. So I will, love... one thing I will say is that the Island Grown Food Co-op is only open to members within a certain region. True. I'm just, True. I guess in our area in central Washington, there isn't, there aren't nope. any USDA mobile slaughters. We're actually um, applying for a grant to purchase a USDA mobile slaughter unit, but it's not going to it's not going to be mobile because by their own regulations, it has to be covered by a roof. So there's I don't know. There's some things about that that I don't understand, which we, we could talk about. Let's talk. Separately. We have so we have so much to talk about. You and I. Let's make yeah. sure that we that we get together and and uh, set up a meeting. Okay. And one more, David, before you move on, um, Marcy asked, "How do we get a processor to tell us if they're increasing prices? Do I need to ask them each time? It's frustrating to pre-sell animals and have the prices increase at pickup." Awesome question. And and just just so everybody knows. The, the first half of the presentation is the longest. And so we, we have plenty of time for these questions. These are great questions, Marcy. So I, I want to say that uh, I want to say that this should be a, a regularly scheduled thing. And unfortunately, most processors are still kind of living in, hey, this is an agricultural side activity, not we are a small manufacturing plant. We're t my, my organization is trying to uh, educate processors to adopt more manufacturing 
behavior and price, regular price assessments and increases and regular communication is part of that manufacturing mindset. Unfortunately, today, it usually happens from, a, oh my gosh, we're not making money. We need to raise our prices. And it's totally random. And it, it feels kind of like, it feels like you're being accosted as a producer, right? It's just like, how many more of these are going to pop up? That's a really good question. And I think, I think it's worth asking if you have any sort of relationship, say like, hey, what are you guys doing? Are you doing an annual, annual cost reassessment? Is it random? You know, what can I look to expect? Because I have to, I have to pass these costs through to my customers. And my customers are a lot happier when this happens once a year in January or once a year in harvest season in my, in my annual newsletter or whatever, you know, let them know why it's important to you and why it's important to your customers and see if maybe they might be willing, who knows, maybe, maybe they don't have a lot of financial acumen. Maybe you know how to run your books really well. Maybe you say, look, I'd be willing to help you go through and, and, and talk about how to, how to structure your, um, your financial documents or, or understand your margins if you'd be interested in collaborating, I could help you with that. Um, and, and maybe we can put some structure to your fee increases. I think there's a lot of ways to approach it. It just depends on your relationship with them. But I feel your pain and it should not be so random, truly. Okay, so <clears throat> moving along, section three, uh, you've got a slaughter date. What's next? So the key takeaways for this section are understand common fee structures and what, what you can expect to pay for. Walk through examples of different cut sheets and discuss the benefits or drawbacks of each and become familiar with other considerations such as third-party certifications and co-packing versus cut and wrap, which is a really interesting discussion I think you'll find. So common fee structures. <clears throat> Prices that you see as a producer are a pretty common formula when it comes to manufacturing. It's, it's, it's different from restaurant uh, pricing. It's more like manufacturing. So cost of goods sold, ingredients, labor, packaging, plus a margin that covers overhead. So sanitation, management, utilities, anything that's not direct labor is all in the overhead. So the margin has to cover all of that, including debt service and investor return. Whatever's left after that might be a small profit. Most plants are operating under razor thin margins because they benchmark off of their neighbors for pricing rather than doing activity based costing. So this is some of the work that uh, I know Olivia does. I'm sure that Cuvera does, uh, that NPAN does. We try to teach act, uh, true costing uh, to producers and processors so they understand what they need to charge. Olivia has some awesome resources for costing and yielding calculators that she's going to include. And we won't dive into that too much today, but that's, that's what you're paying for. That's what it's covering. Unfortunately, a lot of processors around the country, like I said, are benchmarking. And so they're competing on price, uh, which inevitably leads to a lower quality product for you most of the time, right? Price is never a good way to compete. It's never a good differentiator for anybody. Um, more on that later. So things that you can expect in today's day and age, slaughter is generally speaking, and there's a lot of outliers here, but this is the general range that you can look for. 85 to $150 per head. I've seen mobile slaughter uh, operations charge over $200 a head because moving those trucks is so expensive. It's so time consuming. It's so inefficient to go to each farm and have every farm be a different setup you know, uh, have different humane handling uh, setups and, and whatnot. So you'll see a huge fluctuation with mobile, but generally 85 to 150 for beef, 65 to 120 for hogs is what you're looking at per head. And lamb are generally 65 to 125 a head. When you get into that, that upper range, it tends to be all inclusive. So it's 125 a head all the way through processing for a lamb. You'll see that often. Raw fabrication, that includes grinding uh, most of the time. That's $0.90 cents to $1.35 for beef, uh, 85 to $1.10 a pound for hogs, generally speaking. Those lower ends are probably barely covering costs. I will say that in today's day and age, barely. Um, very quick anecdote. 
I, I used to run a meat, a vertically integrated meat company in California <clears throat> who sh shall go unnamed <laughs> today. Uh, and we got to a point where we needed to get into the consumer packaged goods market. We wanted to be in Whole Foods market and we wanted to be in some other places like that. So we had to be processed at a place that had more modern packaging. I went there personally and, and went with their CEO and watched my carcasses be fabricated off the pallet through final package. And we did activity-based costing. Now this place was in LA, so the labor was higher and this was in 2020. Um, but what we found was by doing time trials and taking labor into account, they could not put a stake into a package for less than $1.25 a pound. And that does not include kill. So that's why I say most plants that are charging 90 cents uh, are less efficient than these guys because they were the best processors in Los Angeles. They had the corner on the entire restaurant market. They couldn't put something into a package for less than $1.25 a pound. Smaller processors are much less efficient and, and therefore are likely not covering their costs at those lower prices. Um, <clears throat> Value adds, you can also expect to pay $1.25 to $2.25 for fresh sausage, two to three bucks a pound for cooked. Snack sticks are three to six dollars a pound. Jerkies, five to 12. Bacon's $1.50 to four bucks a pound. And it depends on who is processing. So we'll get to that in a moment. Cut sheet examples. We're just going to walk through these fairly quickly uh, in the interest of time. So this is a good cut sheet. This has got plenty of variation. It's got lots of options. Uh, you've got several interesting cuts, a mix of steak and uh, roast. You've got some value adds like minute steak, soup bones, neck bones, stew meat, um, you know, items that are a little bit of a differentiator. You can get your off all. Um, you know, you're generally going to be asked for your contact information, any notes, um, and then they're going to go through and they're going to tally everything up. This is a nice cut sheet that gives you some differentiation, some efficiency. Okay. Here's an example of the first cut sheet that I ever created when I was a manager and I was going to differentiate myself because I was a craft butcher. And I was going to make every cut under the sun so that you could sell out of your farmer's market stand. And guess what I did? I worked a lot of overtime because, uh, and I lost a bunch of money because you could get every single thing that you've ever seen on the Meat Hooks Instagram right here on this cut sheet. And uh, that works for a small butcher shop because they're budgeted that way. But processing plants, what happens when we offer this is that it slows the line down. And those metrics that we talked about earlier go through the floor. And I was not charging any extra for this. It was this it, people that got this paid the same as the people who got a, just a basic freezer beef package. And it was also unfair to those other customers who came to me because they were paying the same amount for, for less work, you know? So um, this will bog you down. Another thing I would say is that hypercraft cuts are not a great differentiator because you often have stock outs. We only get two terrace majors off every animal. And if people love them and they will, cause they're great, you only get two per head, right? And that's a challenge uh, to constantly have that conversation with your customers. Yeah, the baseball cut. It's a it's a it's a good one, right? <laughs> and and this is one that is is kind of you know disappointing in a sense. No offense to Rebrook Custom Meat Processing, but this is the basic bare bones cut sheet. This is what my great grandparents used to get, right? It's like you got some you got some steaks, you got some roasts. They are some size, and they're coming to you probably paper wrapped, right? And there's not a lot of options here. This is better for a family who's getting a, a, a whole or a half, but this is not really a great differentiator for an e-commerce platform or a farmer's market. So walking through these cut sheets with your processor and understanding what your options are and what you're going to pay for those extra options is very, very important. Um, and I highly recommend having this conversation with somebody before dropping your animals off. Uh, some other considerations as you've got your slaughter date, packaging options. How am I getting packaged? Am I going to be, you know, what do my customers expect? Am I selling through a retailer? Do we need roll stock packaging? Is it coming to me paper wrapped? 
Is it coming in a vacuum package? These are really important things to discuss before you uh, commit to a date and bring your animals in. Don't let this ha don't let this conversation take place after the animal's dead because it won't be a pleasant one. It'll be fast and it'll be forced. Fresh versus frozen. What's your program? Are you selling frozen meat? Are you uh, selling um, fresh meat? And how do you need to time your pickups? And and how do you you know how does the the facility handle your product. So inquiring about what their freezing process looks like is really important. Do they have a blast freezer or is it simply a still freezer? Um, and depending on how much meat you take in, are they freezing an entire pallet or just small boxes one at a time? All good questions. Co-packer versus cut and wrap expectations. There's two worlds of value-added processing. There's cut and wraps that offer sausage and bacon and ham and, and various items. <clears throat> These are what we're used to seeing at the farmer's market or, or with small producers. And then there's co-packers. Co-packers are manufacturing facilities that have very clearly uh, created and lined out processes and programs. It's going to feel stuffy and rigid and formulaic, but it is that way because they know exactly what it takes to produce your products efficiently and profitably at the level of quality that you expect. So these are the types of places where you can get things created that are often under third-party certifications and can be sold at the level of quality that you expect at a retailer. So for instance, Applegate Farm sausage made at a co-packer. Most sausage that you see at a farmer's market with a white label, slightly inconsistent lengths, you know, uh, everybody's got the same flavors, whatnot. Those are all done at cut and wraps for the most part. And there's a major, major uh, differences in options when it comes to packaging and fulfillment and labeling and product specifications and whatnot. But when you go to a co-packer, you must expect it's going to cost more because it truly reflects costs and you will probably pay for R&D if you want something special, okay? <clears throat> um, any questions on that before we jump into our last section? One note on third-party certifications. If you would like to move from retail exempt or your current farmer's market or D2C business model into a wholesale model, so this could be getting into farm to school movement. Uh, this could be getting into a retailer or the co-op system or what have you. You may be required to get your meat processed at a facility that has a third party certification. Those major cert certifications are going to be SQF or if it's a cooked product, BRC. Uh, but it's some third party that represents the global food safety initiative. And um, this is a much higher level of quality and compliance than FSIS could ever dream to be. FSIS is the bare minimum to ensure that you have a safe product. SQF is, it's an ISO certification. If anybody here is, is familiar with ISO and manufacturing, it's a very high level. And um, when you have a processor that is certified in that way, then not all are, because it is very expensive to implement. You have a lot more options when it comes to distribution and sales outlets. So that's one thing to inquire about. Sometimes producers co-invest in bringing those on board if they want to expand where they can sell their product. Okay, so if no questions, we are going to move into section four after harvest. Harvest is done, now what do we do? Key takeaways from this section are, explore some typical data points that processors and producers should track. Become familiar with basic yield expectations and what can affect those numbers. And understand the impact of yield loss. Tracking yields. What should I expect? What are yields and why do I need to track them? There are three main types of yields that you and your processor should track. Live to hot yield. So live animal to hot carcass. Just got split and washed. This is what it weighs. Hot to cold or chilled or aged yield. Three different ways to say that same thing. 
there is a significant loss between the day that it's hot and the 14 days that it's aging, up to 5% sometimes, depending on the relative humidity and the temperature of the cooler. That 5%, as we'll see momentarily over time, over the course of a year, it's a lot of money, right? 5% on a carcass just for ease that weighs 1,000 pounds. That's not insignificant. So that's something to track. And then carcass or cold yield to final package good or cut yield. Those are the three that, that I highly recommend. Um, and yeah, awesome point, Olivia. You pay for the hot weight. So if you age for 28 days and you lose 10% of your carcass weight, you're still paying for that 10%. Processors will also likely track individual primal and subprimal yields for their own metrics because they need to train their staff to make sure that they are getting the best possible yield on those subprimals. So that's a, a very common thing in a plant. And yields are a good measure of your own finishing uh, efficiency as well as the plant's quality and consistency. And we'll talk more about the implications of yields and how to measure those. So typical data points to track uh, uh, beyond those three that we talked about, again, are live weight, hot weight, live to hot yield, chilled weight, packaged weight, hot to packaged yield, chilled to packaged yield, and individual skew yield. And so when I say individual skew yield, what I like to do is um, generally a processor has the capability of producing for you what's called a grand total. And that's where you see your total packaged weight, which is a yield off of the hot weight. So you've got that. And then you've got the total weights of each skew or cut. And you can extrapolate percentage yields out of each one of those and track those from animal to animal, which is cool because then you can see, oh, this genetic line has a significantly heavier rib section every time than this one. Or, uh, you know, you can look at, for instance, this diagram here that's courtesy of uh, University of Tennessee. You can start to look at the primals and, and see like the chuck on this genetic line or this breed is always 10% more than this. I mean, it would never be 10% more, but, you know, it's, it's a, a huge amount of variation in between certain finishing practices or finishing rations or, or genetic lines. These are all data tells the story. Right, So the, the more that we track and measure, the more that we can decide on how to become better at what we do. But it's also a way to hold your processor accountable over time, right? That's so what's really important is, as an example, I'm working or have worked with a plant on the East Coast who did not track yields, but their producers tracked their yields. And the producers were constantly calling them saying, where's my meat? What's happened? I brought you an animal that, that hung at 800 pounds and I got a 30% yield. This is an extreme case. And I just want to say that this almost never happens. This is like half a percent of the time. You know, the butcher stealing your meat is like not a thing, generally speaking. It's actually really hard to make it so people don't get their meat back. But this particular processor had major inventory issues and production planning issues and would at times overage or mix up meat. And it took the producers tracking their own yields to spotlight that. Then they called me and I went in there and we fixed it. Um, but, but knowing what you have is, is very, very important for those reasons. So <clears throat> here's a couple of example meat uh, yield calculations that you can use on your end just to begin tracking if you don't get those reports. Typical calculations. Here we go. Live weight times a typical dressing percentage, which uh, we, we, we've got some over to the side there, courtesy of University of Wisconsin Extension. I can help you with some more, uh, some more typical weights, but li your live weight times a typical dressing percentage equals hot carcass weight. So I've got a 1,300 pound heifer. Typically beef, a typical cutout will be a 62% yield. Um, I'm sorry, not a cutout, but a typical dressing weight off of a beef is a 62% yield, and that's going to be 806 pounds. Now let's follow that through. Your carcass weight, your hot carcass, times the cooler shrink percentage 
or 100% of the carcass weight minus cooler shrink equals your chilled carcass weight. So that eight, that same 806 pound carcass with a 4% loss equals 773 pounds. See, that's a pretty significant amount of loss just in the cooler. Then your final uh, example here of a calculation that you should use is your chilled carcass weight times final packaged yield. That equals how many pounds of finished goods you should have. And you can reverse that order to figure out what your yield is. So if we've got 773.76 pound carcass after chilled weight from the the, the step above, and they got a 63% yield off of that, which is fairly typical, uh, that's going to equal less than 500 pounds of meat. Now, if you got that 487 pounds of meat and you knew your hot weight or your chilled weight was 773 pounds, you divide the finished weight by the chilled weight, you get your yield. So there's ways to track these, and I highly recommend tracking these by animal um, to see where the variation lies and, and, and what might be changing. This is only beef. These principles apply to hogs. They apply to lamb. Um, there's just you know a lot more we can talk about there, but each species has a different typical yield. Hogs are a much higher yield, right? Because we use the fat and so many more things. We, we, we trim less. Um, we use the belly in their entirety. Lambs tend to be a similar yield to that of beef. Many factors uh, will affect this, as you can see in the small table on the right. Dairy beef is a lower yield. You know, the New York strips are, are, are very, very small a lot of times in Holsteins, and some producers will try to push them ultra hard on grain at the very end to fatten them up. It's still yield loss. You're just paying for that yield loss, right? They're going to put on a bunch of hop fat, be fatter in a tick, and then it's all going to get trapped, uh, uh, trimmed off, right? Uh, Grass-finished beef, unless it's 30 months or older, typically has a lower yield. Um, but when you have an older grass-fed beef that has good marbling, but they might have less of a fat cap, you might have a higher yield. Uh, more gut fill. If you bring in your animal and you think you've got a 1,600 pound steer and they've got 300 pounds of uh, baleage in their tummy, you may be surprised at how low your yield is, right? So we generally recommend leaving your animals off feed for the last 18 hours before slaughter if you can. Um, how, you know, dirty hide, that's a really big one. We'll have some just absolute mud monsters come into the plant and they've got 150 pounds of mud on their hide and that, that's something that can lower yield. Um, if you have bone in or boneless cuts, obviously there's some significant yield changes there. Um, and then in table three, you'll see some interesting, uh, typical percentages of your primals that come off your animal. And so these are kind of some things that you can compare and, and, uh, we can follow up afterwards to talk more about yields individually. I've got plenty of time to coach you through what it would look like uh, to track those. I know Olivia has some great resources for yield calculators as well. We have a ton yeah, of stuff. Just, that, yeah. I'm sorry. David, no, please. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to jump in and just let y'all know, because I think probably most of you are asking like, well, how do I track it per animal? And this is what David's referring to. And I'm going to drop in the chat. We have through the Southwest Grass-Fed Livestock Alliance, <clears throat> regardless of whether you're grass-fed or grass-finishing or not. Um, a yield and margin calculator that we built. And it has a webinar instructional that goes along with it. You have to be a member to access those two resources. Membership is free for the first year, at least, and sliding scale pay what you want after that. So it's, I, I can't emphasize enough the importance of what David's um, telling you here, which is that you're responsible for your own tracking for the most part. I work with a lot of producers who don't get anything except for an invoice. There is no processing report. There is no subprival totals. There is no grand total. There's nothing. It's really common nationally. And so it's your job to track that, um, what comes into your house so that you know what you're actually making. And if you're not, you really have no way to understand whether your business is going to be viable in the long run. So I encourage you all to just take a look there at our tool and our webinar. And um, you'll find when you go to that link, there's a bunch of other resources there too. So just 
um, poke around. Yeah, awesome points, <clears throat> Olivia. You know, I, I I tend to sometimes uh, color color my message based on best practice at a, at a processor. But the reality is, is there's a lot of very small establishments that don't track these things. And um, these are some fantastic tools that, that Swiggle has put together. And um, I, I highly recommend, I'm kind of a data nerd. I love it. I love analyzing numbers and making decisions from it and have it, having those, those numbers tell me the story of what's happening. When I manage a plant, when I see fluctuations on the kill floor, on hot weight versus live weight, I know that probably my trimmers at the end are trimming for visuals rather than food safety. They want the carcass to look nice and neat rather than leave it all on and just make sure it's clean, right? There's little things that can help me adjust my management of my personnel on the plant, but a lot of plants don't do that. And so um, if, if you would like some additional uh, help or assistance with tracking those yields beyond what Olivia's resources are, you know, we're all very happy to chat with that, chat about that. I did want to share this table and, and my, for some reason, I don't know why, when I share this, when I blow this up, it cuts a bunch of the, the graphic off, which is weird. But um, what I, what I want to emphasize here is the implications of yield loss. Okay. And I'm happy to send this to everybody and the resources. So it's not cut off and you can see it. Um, and this is the kilogram version. Uh, we have a pounds version as well. But basically what this shows in a nutshell is, let's say in that yellow box, it's 350 kilos an animal, which is about, let's call it 700 pounds. And <clears throat> this, this is a, a spreadsheet that I've used in a, in a plant that I've worked with in Canada. That's why it's in kilos. And what we wanted to calculate is what happens? What's the implication? What can my crew see? What happens every single time we lose uh, 1%, 1% yield off of an animal, okay? Up at the top, you can't see it. There's a, a price per pound for the beef. It's about six bucks a pound, okay? Every time you lose 1% yield, one animal per day, we're losing 28 bucks. Per week, we're losing 140 bucks. Per year, we're at $7,000. And that's one animal per week. Okay. Or one animal per day. I'm, I'm sorry. Put that up to five animals per day. We're looking at $35,000 loss per year, right? And that's 1%. So if you're a producer, let's just say you're going to kill one head uh, per week, every month, you know that you are going to be losing a significant amount of money every 1% you lose, right? And that's uh, especially when you realize that you're paying for hot weight, but you're selling off of cold packaged, right? So, uh, this shows up, This these yield loss can happen all across the board. And that's why it's important to track. If you have extended hang times, you're going to look at three to 5% up until that 14 day hang. If you go beyond that, you could dry out up to eight or 9%. That additional percentage is going to be significant money on your end over the course of a year if you're slaughtering all year, okay? That yield loss can happen uh, sometimes the way that a plant breaks your animal. Some, some plants break between the fourth and fifth rib on the chuck. Some break between the fifth and sixth rib. A chuck is worth 35% what a rib is. That's a huge yield loss over the course of a year when you stack it up. Now, it might not just be where they break it between ribs. It could be something that's really subtle. We found that there could be as much as a 1% yield loss depending on how close to the bone you get when you break certain parts of the animal. So there's all these tiny factors that go into yield loss and it's it's deeply, deeply important to, tra to track those as a processor or a producer and uh, hone the edge of your strategy to maximize your profits. You might find that you absolutely must hang your beef for 14 days. Your customers, you've got a grass-fed beef, um, it's got a nice fat coverage. You at, your value prop is that it's dry age for 14 days and people go 
crazy for it, right? And you're not budging on that. However, you may also have a significant pipeline of call. Maybe you have a contract with a, a partner farm up the road who's got a dairy and they're doing dairy call and you are doing wholesale ground beef in the, uh, you've got a farm to school customer or, or something. Uh, what I would recommend is if you've got animals that are going directly to grind, I will almost always recommend having those animals ground between three and five days hanging because you will save three to 4% off of yield loss. And you may find that you enjoy the flavor as much because it is a, it's a, it's a more of a moist, you know, palatable, juicy ground beef. So these are choices that you may want to make based on your yield tracking um, that can drive you more towards profitability. So I, I do highly recommend uh, uh, really, really uh, digging into those numbers. So that's what I've got for the presentation. I'm, I'm really excited to field any questions that you may have, but some of the key takeaways in my conclusion are, you may not need federal inspection. Retail exemption has so many options for you uh, to have a, a reduced barrier to entry into retail sales that, that um, I highly recommend exploring those if you're able to. And that doesn't necessarily mean building your own facility. It could be renting uh, or cooperating within a space. Striving for win-win partnerships with your processor. As we know, you know, a lot of you mentioned in the chat what your values are, but what some of your challenges are. And I think more often than not, if you can find a way to have those open conversations and ask those questions about how you can be a great customer to them, but how you can also get your needs met, win-win uh, partnerships are going to show up on both of your bottom lines. Optimizing and simplifying your cutting orders to maximize inventory and profits. Simplifying and optimizing can be different. You know, I, I certainly don't think that everyone should only have chuck roasts and ground beef. We need to be able to differentiate ourselves in a way that is exciting uh, for us to sell and, and for our customers to enjoy, um, but also understanding ways that you can gain efficiency through your, uh, through your cut sheet management. And last but not least, what you don't measure, you cannot manage. And uh, if you take that a little further, what you don't manage, you can't control. And if you don't control it, it controls you. That's a, a, an old line that a, a former mentor of mine shared with me. And uh, we do highly, highly recommend managing and tracking your, your data as much as possible. So that's all I've got. Um, that's a, a website where you can find me there, northwoodsgroup.org. That's my Instagram handle. If you want to send me kind of a casual, easy message, a farm butcher. Um, I've done lots of farm butchery in my in my days. And there's an email that you can get a hold of me very quickly, david at northwoodsgroup.org. Uh, that's, that's something that goes directly to me and, and I will see. So um, any questions that are in the chat, I would love to chew the fat for another 15 minutes. I had a question. Uh, it was in the chat and it had to do with the dry aging time. I'm current. I do grass finished. They have been uh, Corriente cattle from Mexico, which are raised here on the ranch in Texas. And we have crossed them with Wagyu and they are amazing. Yes. Nice. But that loss on that 14 days, I've been thinking about it. And would you recommend dropping that to seven days? Here's what I would recommend. Do a taste test, have one beef go in okay. and, and be a seven day age and then have okay. one be a, a 14 and have someone that you trust very much prepare some grind and some steaks and a roast or what have you. And don't know what it is yourself okay. as, as, as the owner and have a blind taste test with some of your favorite customers too. And have everybody okay. come in and just have like a, a potluck dinner and, and have fun with it. And um, okay. take some opinions, but I I do think that there is a real benefit to the seven to day seven to ten day range. I do okay. think that there is because it's not just drying out that you lose; it's also because of most air handling systems not being able to mitigate uh, humidity in a way that we like in very small establishments. We oftentimes will find mold growth or yeast growth on the outside of the carcass that all has to be cut off, right? So that's an additional loss that you're going to have that might not even have to do with drying. Definitely something to think about. Great, great question. 
Okay, oh, great. I also want can to I add to that, that real quick too for yes. you, Marcy? I just, David said it real quick, but definitely like when I've done that in the path, try and get a spectrum of eaters, like people that have different styles of taste, yes. taste okay. in that okay. dinner party, you know, people that are slightly different, you know, think about the cross-section of your customer base, but also your potential customer base, and then get two or three other people in there that are not maybe used to eating dry age or used to eating grass fed or used to eating coriander, you know, get somebody okay. who's used to like grocery store meat butter in there. Right. So you get a more wide range of um, opinions in your little dinner party and okay. dinner party is a great way to do that. And then one other thing, David, that maybe I just want to make sure we clarify hang time versus dry age. Sure. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So just to make sure we're all using the same language here. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and pr processors are, are really bad at that, uh, <clears throat> yeah. confusing the two. So carcass aging is just what it sounds like. You're aging the entire carcass, mm -hmm. right, until cut day. Now, dry aging in a, in, a, in a facility that is truly doing dry aging is a separate program. And what they'll do is they'll take your beef down after three days, four days, five days, wherever you say you like the grind, They'll cut that animal down into primals. They'll dry age specific primals. So they'll take your rib section, your New York, your say maybe your top sirloin. They'll take those primals and put them on a cart in a specific room that is climate controlled, somewhere around 36 to 38 degrees with a 70 to 78% relative humidity. And you won't see any mold growth because it's not optimal conditions and, and you'll have a lot less loss. And then you get your grind at that optimal point in that three to five day range. And then you get your dry aged money cuts later on. That's a really sweet setup. And I'm really glad that you brought that up, Olivia, because okay. if you've got yeah. a plant that's able to do that, that's the best of both worlds, right? But you, you may find, um, you may find you've got like a seasonal premium dry age. That's like a 21 to 35 day age but your standard steak is a seven to 10 day and you charge a premium for those dry aged mm -hmm. items, you can figure out a way to make that a value add so that you're adding value and capturing that loss on the super dry age stuff and then yes. capturing your, your full margin on the, on the standard age. So great, great point, Olivia. Thank you for bringing that up. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions? Any other burning, uh, burning thoughts? Or, or maybe I said something there that you, that you, in your experience, um, have found to be not true. I'm, I'm learning from you as much as you're learning from me. Generally speaking. Yeah. Can I ask a question, please? Um, yeah. I, what we find in our market is a lot of people are vacuum packing especially the steaks um what is your opinion on that vacuum packing uh as opposed to like a paper wrap yes yeah great great question um <clears throat> there's a lot of people who are very firm believers in paper wrap you know, there's a, a layer of plastic and a very tight paper wrap and some of the paper wrappers that i see out there that have been doing it for a long time are absolute wizards. I mean, they are very, very skilled and fast. However, objectively speaking, from a shelf life and appearance standpoint, vacuum packing is the way to go. Uh, it's what your customers are going to expect. Well, I'm only speaking about US customers. John, I know you're, you're, you're calling from very far away. So this is kind of your standard US customer is expecting your beef to be a certain color. They want to see it through the package. They want it to be, um, they want it to have a good shelf life. They want it to be able to either be fresh or be thawed and not have to use at that moment. What we find is that thawing paper wrapped beef is a little bit more challenging for the modern eater. It's not something that you can thaw very quickly. Um, and uh, there's, there's a lot of other benefits. I'd love to hear from other producers and processors and their thoughts on it. Personally, I prefer vacuum sealing because I know the integrity of the product is going to maintain. There are some challenges. Sometimes you get leakers, you get pop packages, but those are very easy to dial in uh, with your equipment specialist or, or, or with your product specs. Um, 
the bags at this point have become pretty inexpensive, generally speaking. I'm not sure about where you're calling from about the supply chain there, but here in the U.S., the bags have become quite cheap. They're usually around three to seven cents a piece or less. Um, <clears throat> so so I, I do recommend vacuum sealing, especially if you've got a fresh program, because it mitigates the outgrowth of uh, of spoilage organisms. You know, it's not just pathogens that we're looking out for. We're looking out for mold and yeast and the reduced oxygen packaging can help stave that off for quite a while. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, David, I'll jump in to ask in the order of the chat. So um, is goat pretty much the same as lamb in terms of, I think the carcass yield is what you're referring to. Yeah, I, I believe so. I the, most of the goat producers that I work with here are, um, you know, the goats are are finished a little bit less aggressively than sheep, so you might find a little bit higher yield on goats. They tend to be a leaner, small ruminant, but for the most part, you're in the ballpark. Awesome. And then um, Sandy was asking for new producers and fairly new to to her town. Um, any tricks on finding a good processor other than searching online, asking friends and neighbors? That, let's see, that's the best way. Asking friends and neighbors is absolutely the best way. I like to go to the farmer's market and ask other producers there. Another, you know, if let's say hypothetically you were in a more competitive market where maybe other producers are, are, are not as forthcoming or maybe feeling more competitive, or maybe you just don't feel comfortable having that conversation as a new producer. Another thing you can do is if, if their meat is inspected, you can look at the label and there could be some clues there. There may They may list the processor, that oftentimes happens. But if it says produced for or prepared for and doesn't list the processor, there will be a USDA legend of inspection, AKA the bug, we call it. It's the round you know, stamp of approval. And there's an establishment number on there. And you can go on the USDA website and look up establishments by their establishment number, or you can reach out to your local USDA FSIS office and say, hey, I got a package from this establishment number. What is this establishment? And they will tell you uh, who that is. If anybody else has um, some advice too, I know a lot of you have done this before, so. Oh, Lisa, are you talking? No. Okay, any other questions for David? Well, it's been a pleasure uh, working with all of you today and, and getting to meet you. And, and um, just know that I'm, I'm totally available for all of your questions and follow-ups and uh, look forward to speaking with you more in the future. Thank you so Thank much, you. David. Truly very interesting stuff. So, so glad to have you. Thank you. Thank you, David, really. Awesome. And just to make sure everybody saw it in the chat, the slides will come to you as well in Taylor's follow-up email. And yeah. we hope to see you in May for our next webinar. Sounds good. You guys have a good rest Bye. of the day. Bye. Thanks, everyone.